Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for an intimate conversation between two descendants of uh, prisoners of Studhoff. Uh, this morning, we are going to be joined by Dr. Marilyn Kingston and Sylvia Foti. Uh, Marilyn and Sylvia will compare how their family members were treated and the reasons they were in Studhoff in the Studhoff concentration camp at the same time. They will address the fraud by the Lithuanian government to declare Noreka innocent of crimes of genocide and how his detention in Sudov has been used as a misleading political tool for Lithuanian Holocaust deception. So our first guest this morning is Dr. Marilyn Kingston. And Marilyn, let's bring you on stage. Marilyn, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Uh, Marilyn Kingston, for everyone watching, uh, is the former vice president of the International Network of Adult Holocaust Sorry, the, the, <laughs> I told you I'd mess this up. The vice president of the International Network of Adult Children Holocaust Survivors. Is that right? I think that's yes. close enough. Okay. Yes. All right. And, and also the uh, the co-president of Second Generation um, of Survivors. So Marilyn, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, so first, so, uh, today we're talking about your, your mother. Um, Correct. And do, do you want to share her name? Sure. Sasha Kingston. Sesha Kingston. And so um, Sesha was in Studhoff. That is correct. And um, can you tell us, uh, at, at what age, by the way, did she go into Studhoff? She was not quite 18. Okay. And um, can you tell us a little bit about her life before she entered into Studhoff? Of course. My mother grew up in Lodz, Poland. She was one of five children. When the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, she and her family were shipped into the Ludge Ghetto. She was in the Ludge Ghetto until 44, when they started to liquidate the ghetto. And in August of 1944, she was shipped with her sister, her mother, two, and two brothers, and a baby, well, a baby under three, to Auschwitz. She lost her, her father had been shipped there earlier. She lost her father, her mother, a brother, and her baby sister in Auschwitz. From Auschwitz, she and her older sister, who is about 18 months older or so, they were shipped to Stutthof. And she was in Stutthof until there was a way for her to escape. And I'm happy to tell you how that happened whenever sure. you want. So so, so, so first, I think we have um, some pictures of your mother here. Yes. Um, so let's look. So this first, um, so the first, I guess this would be the youngest picture of her, and this is her here? Yes, that's the youngest picture we have. And the only reason we have it is because it was sent to Israel before the war, and a great aunt saved it. That's the only picture we have before the war. Amazing. And where was this taken? Do you know? That was taken, and they were on a, a vacation resort. <coughs> Pardon me. And and do you happen to just out of curiosity, do you know what year it was taken? Well, my mother, were, uh, she was, I think, five and a half in that picture. Okay. Okay. And then I guess this would be the next oldest one or the next one in line. I guess maybe these two look like they're, they're very similar. They're, they're taken about the same time. Those were taken after yeah. the war when my mother and father were in the Lomper Time Displaced Persons Camp. Okay. And this is your father here. That is correct. That's and a great, that's a great photo. Thank you. I love that mm -hmm. photo. And that was taken in 1947. Okay. And then this, this is, must be the, the latest <laughs> photo. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's just one I really love of my parents yeah. at their 50th wedding anniversary and my older mm -hmm. son, my father's holding my older son. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. And I think it's important to note uh, for viewers that your mother is still with us. Correct. Fortunately for me. Good, 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 good. Well, fantastic. So, um, so what year? So, your mother was eighteen when she entered about into Stutthof. About, yeah, about 18. eighteen. And and do you know what year that was? Sure, that sure. was um, forty four. Got in it. In the winter okay. of nineteen forty four. And so, can you? Has she has she spoken much to you about her experience, or how? What what is her how, how do you know the, these stories? Or what is, what is her sense of sharing the, these? I, I, know, I know I ask 
I ask because I know that some people are, are uncomfortable sharing the stories, but has she been very open with you about? My mother's been extremely open our entire lives. And she was very, very active in the ADL Speakers Bureau and in other organizations because she went to all sorts of schools all over the country talking about her experiences. So she and she's always been very open and she's shared with me from the moment I asked her about it. She shared with me and I have selective memory. I've asked her the same question maybe 300 times and every time she gives me the same answer and understands that I have selective memory and perhaps the answer is too difficult for me to keep with me. Sure, sure. So um, do you want to walk us through what her experience was like from entering into Strudhoff and, I can how, and do how, how long was she, yeah, how long was she there? Over six weeks, between six and okay. seven weeks. They had oh. um, no shoes. Mm-hmm. She had a thin dress, as did her sister. She was with her older sister the whole time. They were together the entire war. And my aunt, fortunately, is still with us. And... They had no shoes. They had no beds. They were in crowded bunks. Um, It was horrible standing in line for roll call. Just horrible, horrible conditions. And starving, of course, starving. And as she said, she never quite understood what it was from Auschwitz to Stutthof before that in the ghetto. She said, all we did was we were Jews. That was it. And so it became to her, it became for her, I'm here because I'm Jewish and this is awful. And these are not real people that are doing this to us. She was in Auschwitz for, as I said, over six weeks. And then she was led on a death march. Now on the death march, it was freezing. And all around them, women were being shot because they couldn't keep up with the march. They simply couldn't do it. They were starving. They were sick. They were scared. And women were shot. Or they just dropped. They just dropped and they were left there. She was marched to the sea with her sister. And fortunately for my mother and my aunt, the Allied forces just happened to fly overhead. Wow. Yes, that's how she survived. And the guards took cover. When the guards took cover, she took her sister's hand and they ran. Six other young women ran with them and they ran and they ran and they ran. She survived the rest of the war. They split up, except for my mother and her sister were together the whole time. She survived the rest of the war posing as a Polish Catholic girl. But remember, she didn't have papers and she looked pretty sick. And they went from farm to farm to see if somehow they could get a little bit of work so they could eat. Right. Wow. Um, I want to explore that further, but can you talk a little bit about the conditions at Stutthof and, and just describe what it was like moment to moment for your mother, if you can? It was absolutely, positively horrific. Beyond anything I think we can imagine or fathom. Freezing, starving, crowded, lice, typhus, scarlet fever, rampant all around them, and they were mm-hmm. scared. And they had already lost their father, their mother, a brother, and a sister. So it was beyond anything we can fathom. My aunt lost her toes in the in the death march because she had no shoes and it was snowing. Mm-hmm. And she had her toes amputated. But again, they posed as Polish girls so she could get to a hospital so that she, she could have them amputated. Right. Now, so just, just to explore that for a moment... Uh, during the the death march, yes, and then her eventual escape, yes. Um, where where was this exactly? Do you know? Yeah, it was near Gdansk. And then, uh, so so did they have to hide? They had to hide the fact that they were Jews. I'm guessing. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And they had no papers, of course, and they looked pretty bad. They were very skinned. I mean, they were so thin, you know, and they didn't have hair and. They didn't have clothing, so it was it was horrific. It was their horrific. heads were sh- their heads were shaved. I'd be, yes, my mother said initially when they were shaved in Auschwitz, she didn't even recognize her sister, and her sister right. didn't recognize her. They were also given clothing that purposely, of course, 
you know, those horrible, horrible dresses my mom said that didn't fit. My mom was has always been very slight and she was given this huge dress. And so that's how it went. That that was just part of the torture. Right. Um so Ari uh, is asking, um, what what were the times your mother was at Studhoff? I know you'd mentioned the year. Do you know? Do you want to mention it again for Ari? It was winter of forty four. Winter of forty four. Okay. And thank you, Ari, for that question. And just a reminder for everybody watching: if you do have questions, uh, put them in the comments below, and we will bring them uh, on screen. Um. During and I just want to go back to the the escape just just quickly. Sure. Um, we we talk a lot about in, in these streams in the past about how average in this case Lithuanians would murder would often yes. murder their neighbors or murder um, yes Jews obviously. Um, is is that was that a concern for your mother as she escaped that she would encounter that kind of uh, danger or? Uh, was it from Nazi soldiers, Lithuanian soldiers, or all the above, maybe? It was from all of the above. And of okay. course, it was horrible. And the Poles were not forthright, were not giving, were not there to help them, as we all know. The Poles participated mm -hmm. also. They were complicit. Right. So it becomes a huge problem. That's why they had to pose as Poles. And they learned sure. how to and they learned how to genuflect and they and they spoke perfect Polish because they had gone to private schools prior to the war and their Polish was very good their grammar was excellent they were very very careful never to say anything in Yiddish. Sure. She and my sister. Sure. She and my aunt. Now, what is interesting is that my mother didn't really know Yiddish, so it wasn't that hard. But she was still scared. She didn't really know Yiddish until she had met my father and learned it from him. However, she said they were so scared they would say something that was wrong. You know, and when, when they were going from farm to farm in the outskirts trying to just get enough food to live, they were very, very careful about what they said, how they said it. They said that they couldn't find their parents and they were lost. And could they stay and do some work at, for food? They went from farm to farm. And, and just, and we'll bring in uh, Sylvia here in a moment, but just to continue the story a little bit, um, what what happened next? What what happened well, next? They went from farm to farm, and then they were liberated by the Russian soldiers. Okay. And so then where did, after liberation? Um, after liberation, she and my aunt went back to Lodge, their hometown, to see mm -hmm. if anyone had survived from the family. And as my mother describes it, there were lists and lists, you know, the Red Cross, all sorts of organizations that's listed lists. This was prior to computers. Sure. Lists and lists of those who survived and where they could find them. And they every day they went, they went to different places and they could not, could not find anyone who had survived. And my uncle had survived also, but he was not sent to Stutthof. And my uncle was on a boat on his way to Italy. From Italy, he had hoped to immigrate to Israel after the war. And on the boat, he met someone who said, oh, I saw your sisters before I left. And my uncle said, no, my sisters have all been killed. And he said, I saw them. I saw Sasha and Nadja. My uncle got to Italy, turned around and came back and found my mother and my aunt. Wow. Wow. And, and what, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. And when he came back, there was a curfew in Lodge at the time, and my mother had already met my father. And my father's mother, my grandmother, of blessed memory, my grandmother wouldn't let my uncle in. She said, no, Tesha and Naja's brothers have been killed. No, you can't come in. He convinced her after 25 minutes to let him in. And when they came in, when they came home, they, they were shocked. They couldn't believe that their brother had survived because they were looking so hard for someone. Now, you had mentioned that um, your mother's parents were murdered. Yes, my mother's parents can were you, murdered. Can, can you touch on that for just... just? Sure. My mother's... My grandmother, my mother's mother yes. was sent yes. to Auschwitz with them towards the end of August of 44. And they... Um, she said, my grandmother said to them, you know, it was horrible. It was a cattle car and people were dying all around them. There was no air. There was no food. There was no place to sit. And my aunt, my grandmother said to my mother and my aunt, 
you two stay together. You can survive if you stay together. I'll stay with the baby. And then at the point of Mengele's baton, my mother and her sister were pushed to the right. My grandmother and the baby were pushed to the left. My uncle and his brother were also split up and their brother was also split up and the younger brother did not survive. Wow. Amazing. All right. Um, I just want to bring up a, a couple of um, comments here. Arik uh, mentions uh, that his grandmother was there from August of uh, 44, 44 until the until death, death watch. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Um, here we have Aviva uh, who is saying that um, her mother's sister, Hania, died of typhus and stood off. As you mentioned, yeah. the conditions uh, were not. Yeah. Typhus and scarlet fever were rampant, you know, and, and lice mm -hmm. and, and, and starvation, starvation. Yeah. And, and they were so cold. They were so cold. All right. Um, let's bring up Sylvia Foti. Thank you, uh, Marilyn, for the for the story for your story here. Um, Sylvia. Hi, Dylan. So it's good to have you on again. Um, and so for those who um, haven't watched our past broadcast, uh, Sylvia Foti's grandfather, uh, Jonas Noreka, uh, was also in the Stutthof concentration camp. Um, so he, he was there at the same time, we think, as Marilyn's mother. Is that right? Yeah, he was there from March 1943 until January 45. So he would have been there for those six weeks that Marilyn's mother was there. Okay. So this is, um, so this is kind of an interesting coincidence. Um, can you, Sylvia, tell us a little bit about your grandfather? I mean, again, you, you've, you've been on these broadcasts many times, but share a little bit about your grandfather um, before he went to Studhoff and what led to his uh, being sent to Studhoff? Yeah, my grandfather, uh, well, I grew up with him as a war hero uh, in yeah. Lithuania because he fought against the communists. Uh, but during the Nazi occupation, he was uh, the chairman of the Shole region, which is the highest position a Lithuanian could have under a Nazi. And during that time, he had signed uh, a thousand orders, but a about a hundred of those orders had to do with the Holocaust. And of course, the one order that I always talk about on your show and every other show is the one he wrote in August 22nd, 1941, in which he he called for the rounding up of all Jews and half Jews in the Shole region, and then sent to Jagare, uh, which was um, a small town in Northern Lithuania. And he called for the formation of a brand new ghetto so that all these Jews could be kept there and isolated. And then within six weeks, they were murdered. <clears throat> so that happened in 1941. Two years okay. later, uh, March 1943, he ended up in the Studhoff concentration camp. And what led, what circumstances led to his arrival there? Well, what I want to say is when I was growing up, I always mm -hmm. heard that my grandfather was in a Nazi concentration camp and uh, that he was a big hero in Lithuania. And when I started working on the story about my grandfather and hearing these terrible rumors about him being involved in killing Jews, I kept asking myself, how could it be that he was in a Nazi concentration camp? He must be innocent of killing Jews if he was uh, mm -hmm. against the Nazis. This just doesn't make any sense to me. But um, when I got deeper into the story, I found out that it had nothing to do with saving Jews. Um, he was brought to the Nazi concentration camp because uh, right before March 1943 was the Battle of Stalingrad, which was a very decisive battle in World War II. And it was the turning point against the Nazis and for the Allies. So this was the point right after that, when the Nazis were for the first time very obviously losing, that my grandfather and other Lithuanians finally stood up to the Nazis and in a very apparent and obvious way began their anti-Nazi resistance movement, if you will. 
At this point, the Nazis called for Lithuanians to join the SS. Before this, no Lithuanians were really part of the Nazi party. And um, the Lithuanians, to their credit, this is a very proud moment in Lithuania's history. They said, no way, we're not joining the SS. And in fact, they boycotted the whole campaign to join the SS. And they even you know, sent some really old men walking with canes to come in into the uh, draft areas where they were drafting uh, Lithuanians. And of course the Nazis had to uh, dismiss them because they were too old. So in retaliation to that, the Nazis um, became very upset. And in retaliation to all that, they rounded up 46 of the country's leaders as a punishment for the country of Lithuania for daring to avoid joining the SS. And so my grandfather was one of those 46 men. They were all men. And um, that is why he was rounded up with those 46 to get to the Stutthof concentration camp. Perfect. Um, Arik, and Arik, again, thank you for your questions. Uh, Arik is asking, uh, Sylvia, was your grandfather in charge of the Shaolay ghetto as well? Um, you, he know. was not. Uh, okay. There was, I guess, the mayor of Shaolay who would have been more in charge of it. My grandfather was more like the um, governor of the whole Shaolay region. And so the day to day ghetto would have been more under the, uh, the, the mayor's purview. Got it. Understood. Okay. And so um, I, I, don't, I don't know if we, you know, we have Dr. Zaroff coming on a little bit later. Uh, maybe he can give us more um, history about this. But can you tell us, what, and I'm just curious because I'm ignorant of this. Um, can you tell us why um, the Lithuanians objected to joining the SS when they had already been participating in the murder of Jews prior to the SS really getting involved in Lithuania? Yes, um, this is a really important distinction to make because it's a very, very fine point for outsiders outside of Lithuania. Sure. And even for me, when I was investigating the story, Lithu the whole reason was because of Lithuanian nationalism. Lithuanians did not want to be part of Germany. They, they thought they could have their own independence and be a free and independent nation. They never really wanted to be part of Germany. When this all started, Germans promised Lithuanians their independence and that they would remain free. But, you know, shock of all shocks, the Nazis didn't keep their word. And uh, they tricked, you know, in a sense, they tricked Lithuanians and Lithuanians were very naive to believe it. But um, at the same time, Lithuanians were trying to help in killing the Jews to kind of show favor to the Nazis to say, look, look what good Lithuanians we are. We deserve our independence and our freedom. So sure. when it came to killing Jews, Lithuanians were on board with that part of the Nazi <laughs> program, but they were not on board with joining the Nazis and being part of the SS. So this, this is a very fine point that, that needs to be understood. Got it. Thank you for describing that, um, and we'll explore that more with uh, Ephraim later. Um, uh, so, so your your grandfather arrives in Stutthof. Uh, what was his experience like? So, for the first five six weeks, my grandfather and all forty six men were treated uh, in the same way as all Jews were, except they were not brought there on cattle cars. They were they were driven there, and maybe took a little bit of a train there, but they were fed the whole way, uh, so, so their um, transportation to Stutthof was completely different. In fact, uh, uh, about a week before, they were, all, they were all brought up into Kaunas and they were fed um, eggs and bacon and given cigarettes, and then they were put into a bus, and then from the bus they were transported. Marilyn, are you still with us? Okay. Sorry, my my Wi-Fi <laughs> is acting funny. No worries, no worries. So we we, we left off uh, at, at uh, cigarettes and bacon. Go, <laughs> so sorry, go ahead. From, so from there, uh, from there he was brought to Stutthof. But once they landed in Stutthof, it was it was more like um, the experience Marilyn's mother 
uh, felt. They were beaten, um, they were starved, they were tortured, they were, you know, 500 to a barrack, uh, sleeping on the floor maybe. Um, and so for six weeks, uh, you know, very hard labor, uh, for six weeks, it was the typical experience that everyone, uh, seems to be very familiar with. So that, but it, that was just six weeks after six weeks. And they were there from March, 1943 to January, 1945. It's almost two years minus three months. So sure. just for those six weeks, it was very bad. But after that, for really the majority of the time that they were there, it was a completely different experience. And, and just so I understand, um, and I, I read this in, in your book, um, The Nazi's Granddaughter. Do you have a copy that you can hold up for the handy that you can show viewers? All right. So sure. for those the of you The Nazi's watch, Granddaughter, hey. How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal. Fantastic. And so if you're watching, it's on Amazon. Um, it's everywhere you can buy books. And Sylvia, I think you, there you are. You, you came back. So no worries. Um, so, uh, and you describe your um, grandfather as an honored, what, what, what was it, an honored guest? Yeah. Or so at the six yeah. week period, Heinrich Himmler, who created these death camps to kill people, came up with a brand new designation called honorary prisoner. Got it. This is a very curious designation. I still don't understand uh, why he decided to give it to some and not to others, but very, very few people got it. 40, these, uh, by the time he gave the designation, nine of the 46 had died of disease, typhus, cholera, um, like Marilyn said, scarlet fever, um, starvation. Of those uh, remaining 35, three of them wrote memoirs. Um, and one of them, a really famous one, is by Bali Stroga called Forest of the Gods. And he wrote in here that he lost 60 pounds during that time. Mm -hmm. um, so... Heinrich Himmler gave this designation to, to these Lithuanians, to some Latvian statesmen, and to some Norwegian policemen. Interesting. Um, so after okay. that, um, when they were given this honorary prisoner status, they had, they had a completely different life. They were given, the, the beating stopped, um, they didn't have to do um, the roll call. They um, got their own barracks. So these 35 men got their own barracks, which were normally like for 500 people. They got their own beds. They got sheets. They got pillows covered with pillowcases. They got three blankets. They got new clothes. They got to wear their own jackets. They, uh, before that, they had a, tri a red triangle for political prisoners. They got to remove that. They did have to put on a yellow armband, I guess, to designate that they were prisoners. I think uh, besides all that, they didn't have to work. Um, they, they could choose to work if they wanted to, to stave off boredom. So they could have like a nice job, um, you know, like... Uh, sewing clothes or um, in the library. We, I, I keep You're having back. trouble. No worries. No worries. It's okay. You're back. You're with us. So, so sorry, you, you mentioned that you had access to a library. Yeah. So they could work in a library. My grandfather yeah. with this uh, Professor Yurgutis, who was like 60 years old then, and became a father figure for him. They worked like in a construction bureau, helping to design construction. Um, wow. So, um, so very different life. They did not eat well, so that part was still not as easy. But they could write letters home once a week. They could receive letters from home once a week, and they could receive packages from home. And so this wow. is where they were able to like eat better because the packages could contain food and chocolate, um, 
vegetables, fruits, uh, vitamins. Sorry. You're still with, no worries. I, you're back. <laughs> you're I, don't, back. I don't know no, why look, it's so bad this morning. That's okay. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, bl hello? we'll blame the Lithu. Well, yeah. You can you you're with us, Sylvia? Hello. You we're you're back. You're still. Living for, we'll blame we'll blame the Lithuanian government for trying to interfere with our uh, <laughs> <laughs> with our broadcast. So. Um, uh, Okay, so that that sounds like a very very different experience, obviously, than what what uh, Marilyn's mother Sesho went went through. Um, so maybe Marilyn will will bring you back in um, now, Sylvia. You Sylvia, you had mentioned that um, your grand your your grandfather was writing letters and and all of this. And if I read in your book, he he wrote um, other things in the during his stay there. Can you describe that? Yeah, he wrote uh, 77 letters to my grandmother, uh, which was, you know, maybe one of the most prized possessions that my mother and grandmother had. Um, and then within those letters, he wrote a little fairy tale to my mother uh, in nine installments. And that also was a big treasured item in our family. Those letters now are at the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., um, and everything behind me is part of my archives. The U.S. Holocaust Museum is going to get everything within 10 years um, of my archive. Right. But because those letters are the most prized possession of the archives, um, they they have them. So anyway, the point as far as uh, contrast with, you know, when I, when I grew up, uh, my mom and my mom would like maybe read a little excerpt from the letter or like you know part of the fairy tale from these letters and um, it just seems so amazing to me but then by the time I started writing uh, so many years later I was thinking this is odd I never heard of Jews being able to send home letters to their family like why how come my grandfather got to like how how do these letters even exist from a nazi right. concentration camp so right. just by their very existence is proof of what a different sort of life they had so so um so marilyn yes. uh when you hear that kind of experience that um jonas norica had sylvia's grandfather had what what do you take away from that comparing to what you heard you, was your mother's experience? When you actually compare those two things, it, it, it's yeah. difficult. I mean, I listened to Sylvia and I read Sylvia's book and I think, oh, this is so dramatically different than what happened to my mother. My mother was starving. My mother was freezing. There were no beds and she was scared, scared, lonely, sick. You know, they're very, very different experiences. You know, what I find incredibly difficult to fathom is that the current Lithuanian government is is in denial. You know, they're saying that Sylvia's grandfather was there because he fought the Nazis and what a great person he was when he was responsible for killing thousands of Jews. We have his signature on documents. He was responsible for killing thousands of Jews. And one of my mother's lines, and she says this to anyone who will ask her, because when she speaks at schools, the young kids will say, well, you know, how come you got lucky? How come you didn't die? And she always says they didn't have time. They didn't have time to get us all. It, she doesn't make herself to be a hero or that she outsmarted anybody. It was simply that they didn't have time. And when I hear about Sylvia's grandfather, it rips at me. It actually rips at me. If you're the son or daughter of a Holocaust survivor, and I'm the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, and the daughter-in-law of two Holocaust survivors, it never stops being with you. It shadows my every move. It influences my every decision. I don't think the way my American peers do. It's a very different experience. And certainly Sylvia and I, our, our experiences are, are radically different. And, and Sylvia, for you, same question. What does it mean for you when you hear the the distinction and difference between um, the two experiences? You know, when I was growing up, 
my mom and my grandmother would say so proudly to me, your grandfather was an honorary prisoner in the Nazi concentration camp. And I, I, I grew up feeling so proud that my grandfather was an honorary prisoner. It just seemed such an honor. And, uh, and I would go to like Lithuanian camps and people would say, oh, your grandfather was one of the 46 who, you know, was an honorary prisoner at the Stutthof concentration. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah. And, um, but when I got into this book, into writing this book and really, you know, kind of digging into it. Um, and I saw that Heinrich Himmler had made this designation of making my grandfather an honorary prisoner. I was like, what's the, you know, nobody wants an honor from Heinrich Himmler today in 2021. And so I'm like, right. what is so honorable about getting an honor from Heinrich Himmler? Like, oh my gosh, this is, what is this? What does this mean? I felt disgusted and, and sick to my stomach when I was really beginning to comprehend what was happening and how this was all twisted um, in Lithuania's propaganda for making itself look so good. Because once, once you really go into the history of this and see what really happened, um, you know, nobody, I would love to find out why, I, I never could find a document on this, why they were made honorary prisoners. Now, in these three memoirs that I based um, this on by Bolis Droga, then A Priest in Stutthof by Stasis Ila, and then this other one, um, it's Ustiglotu Vialu Beyond the Barbed Wire by Garvidas. This one wasn't translated into English. They speculated why Heinrich Himmler made them honorary prisoners. And this is what all Lithuanians believe just based on the speculation. The Lithuanian speculation in these three memoirs were that Himmler would have been embarrassed by what Lithuanians would think if he treated those 35 prisoners badly, it would just make the Nazis look bad. Got it, got it. Well, I think then, this is, I think, so, I, I, so I'll give uh, Ephraim just a, a moment here. We're going to bring you up in a second because I think this is a good time for you to um, to come in. But so, sorry, Sylvia, I cut you off. Uh, do you want to finish your thought before we bring up uh, Dr. Zuroff? Well, I was just going to say, uh, and, I, and I'm sure Dr. Uh, Zuroff could, could really get into this. But, you know, then I started talking to uh, Jews in Lithuania when I was there in 2013. And I, you know... I asked them, why do you think Heinrich Himmler made my grandfather an honorary prisoner? And right away they were, and, and it was not just them, I found this in other, other documents too. On the Jewish perspective, it was like, well, he admired the Lithuanians for killing 96.4% of the Jews. Right. So this was a reward to these Lithuanians within this death camp to make them honorary prisoners. Right. Again, that's okay, so speculation, but where else can can it go? Or what other conclusion can you draw? Sure. All right. Let, let's bring in Dr. Zuroff. I'll give him a second. Uh, welcome, Dr. Zuroff. Hi. Hi, everybody. So, so I just uh, so just to um, introduce Dr. Zuroff, this is Dr. Ephraim Zuroff. He is the director of the Israel office of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, uh, this evening for you in Israel and Jerusalem. Um, so just, I want to ask you, uh, first and foremost, just your impression when you hear these two accounts, uh, just h hot off the press, how, how do you, how do you respond? How do you react? First of all, it doesn't surprise me at all because, um, I've read and heard the testimonies of the survivors of Stutthof. I attended the trial of Bruno Day. I heard the testimony of Helena Strand and others. And, uh, so the facts, the facts are well known to me. I think Marilyn uh, really did a great job of conveying the suffering and the horrific conditions that uh, the, the inmates who didn't have honorary status, as, as Sylvia noted, um, and their suffering. And, uh, and Sylvia described a very, a very unique group 
which was treated with kids' gloves, basically, after the first six weeks. In other words, initially they did suffer. They, they, they were not treated that kindly during the first six weeks. But after that, until the end of their stay in Stuttgart, they were priv privileged prisoners who uh, were basically in a summer camp or in a, some sort of like a, a, like a summer camp, winter camp, whatever you want to call it. Sure. So there's no, you know, there's no, there is no, no similarities between the fate of the Jews sent to Stuttgart and the fate of these people who were Lithuanian nationalists and had assisted in the process of the annihilation of Lithuanian Jewry, but then sort of changed their tune when they realized that the, that the Germans are not going to uh, grant them independence. And that desire for independence was one of the motivations, not the only motivation, for the active, zealous collaboration of the Lithuanians in the mass murder of the Jewish neighbors. Interesting. And so we, we had, um, we had um, explored this question about why this honorary status was given. And, and do, can you corroborate Sylvia's uh, point? Is, was, would, was it embarrassment that uh, Heinrich Himmler was nervous about? What, why, what, what was going on here? Well, I think, listen, I think it's obvious. The, these, let's say, take Nareka, for example. He was a person who had assisted the Nazis in a very, very important way. When you look at the events of the Shoah in Lithuania, you know, most people don't even realize this. There were 600 to 900 Germans in Lithuania during the Shoah. Of the 220,000 Jews who, who lived under the Nazi occupation in, in Lithuania, 212,000 were murdered. That's 96.4%, but it didn't end there. More than 5,000 Jews who were deported from Germany, Austria, and France to Kovna were murdered by Lithuanians. And Lithuania, Little Lithuania sent a police battalion of almost 500 men to Belarus, where they murdered at least another 20,000 Jews. So in other words, Lithuania, which had a population, I think of less than 3 million in 1939, responsible for the murder of a quarter of a million Jews. Yeah. Amazing. And and uh, I just want to bring up a comment uh, here quickly um, from Eddie Zilber, who says, my mother was sent to Kovno ghetto, to, uh, from Kovno to Studhoff and suffered as Marilyn described. Uh, she described her, her ordeal in great detail in her testimony. Um, Dr. Zuroff, one uh, question I wanted to uh, put to you, and I know that we want to also explore um, some news that, that you're working on with uh, a new case um, related to Stutthof. Um, but before we get to that, um, can you describe how today the Lithuanian government is using um, Nareka's stay at Stutthof as kind of a smokescreen to hide his crimes? Can you, can you dive into that a little bit, a little bit for us? Okay, first of all, let's begin with the fact that the Lithuanians have manufactured a false narrative of the Holocaust. Right. In other words, this is what you have to understand. When, when the countries that were formerly uh, Soviet republics or under communism made the transition to democracy, they realized that they had to deal with the issues relating to the Shoah because for them, their, their main foreign policy objective from the very beginning was to find a way to be protected from a possible return of the Russians. So in other words, a country like Lithuania, how can Lithu Lithuania has no hope of being able to defend itself against Russia, nor does Latvia, nor does Estonia and the others. Sure. So their main objective from the very beginning was to be able to end, to gain membership in NATO and the European Union. Now, I don't know uh, how many people know about what the Protocols of the Elders of Zion are all about, but it's a, it's a fictional account of a cabal by Jewish leaders to, ru to rule the world and arrange everything according to what they want. But the only place, now we know today that it was written by the Russian secret police, in 1905 by this officer named Milos. And, and uh, we know that it's total fiction, uh, but the one place where they still believe it is in Eastern Europe. And 
they understood from the very beginning that in order to get into the European Union and to NATO, they will have to find a way of dealing with the issue of the Holocaust and to hopefully mend fences with Israel and with the Jewish communities, primarily American Jewry, but not only American Jewry. So in other words, they knew from the very beginning they have to deal with the Shoah. In other words, they can't just walk sure. away, make believe it didn't happen. Okay? But what's okay. the problem? The problem is that they have a very dark past in this Holocaust. And um, there was uh, very widespread complicity in many countries, not only Lithuania. Lithuania is not unique in that respect. In Latvia, it was the same. In Estonia, it was the same. In Ukraine, less in, in Belarus. But on the other hand, you had the Ustasha in Croatia, who murdered 20,000 Jews by themselves and sent another 10,000 to Auschwitz. You had the Romanians, who helped murder Jews in Transnistria and, 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 four, and, and murdered 50,000 Jews in Odessa. You have the Hungarians, who deported 437,000 Jews to Auschwitz, all by themselves. I mean, Eichmann was sitting in Budapest but all the roundups and everything were done by Hungarians. So how do you deal with that? So from the very beginning, and I'll never forget this, I, I was invited to the dedication of a new monument at Ponar, which was the major mass murder site of the Jews of Vilna and other, and other places in, in the surrounding areas. And uh, of course, during the, during the Soviet occupation, these places were marked, but they refused to identify either the victims or the perpetrators. So if you had gone to Ponar before the transition to democracy, there was a monument. What does the monument say to the victims of fascism? Oh, that's a brilliant, uh, that's a brilliant caption. Uh, who are these victims and who killed them? Mm -hmm. but, the, but the Soviets refused to do it because first of all, the Soviets, absolutely refused to acknowledge that the fate of the Jews was unique under the Nazi regime. That's number one. Right. Number two, the fact that the local collaborators played an important role was a direct refutation of the myth of the brotherhood of Soviet peoples. I mean, what ties together a Yakutian, a Turkmenistan, someone from Turkmenistan, someone from Georgia, someone from, from Estonia, someone from Belarus and Ukraine and from Moscow? Oh, they're brothers in socialism. That, right. that, that was the myth. Ah, but one second, if they're brothers in socialism, how can a Ukrainian communist, a socialist, murder a Jewish communist? They're, they're brothers after all. Right? Sure. Impossible. Right. So that's how you get a caption like that. I, I visited the Soviet Union in 85, and everywhere I went, of course, I made it my business to, to, to go to the place of mass murder. In Rombola, outside Riga, in Ponar, outside Vilnius, it's uh, Vilna. The same captions in Mali Trustinets, outside Minsk. So, no truth there. Right. And you have to remember that these countries... They were not liberated. They didn't become Western democracies after World War II. They also had to suffer through the Soviet occupation with all the lies of the Soviets. And to add to this, the Soviets, the one good thing you can say about the Soviet Union is that they took the crimes of the, of the local Nazi collaborators seriously, and they put many of them on trial. So the locals had this feeling, this sense, oh, there's none left. No, all the people who should have been prosecuted have already been prosecuted by the Soviets. But Got that, it. of course, is not the truth. And, and, by, and by the way, Sylvia, that's, that's what ended up happening with your grandfather, right? Yeah, except they, he was not tried uh, as a Jew killer. He was tried as an anti-Soviet for trying to lead a rebellion right. against no. bringing down the Soviet Union. They never once asked him, did you ever kill a Jew? Not once. In those right. 2,000 pages. That's true. But in, and in many cases, some of the people who had killed Jews during the Holocaust were not tried for that. They were tried for treason and joining, <laughs> and joining the, the, the occupiers, the German occupiers. But in fact, they, they had committed those crimes as well. So and, and I think, anyway. and, sorry, go ahead. And, and Ephraim, just on that point real quick, sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, you often make the case 
I think that uh, the the locals were never tried. Is that right uh, for their murder? No, of no, 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 no. They were never yeah. tried once Lithuania got became independent. Listen, okay. I okay. devoted thirty years to trying to get them to prosecute those That's what I, Nazi war criminals. Now, yeah. one of the yeah. interesting parts of this, and this relates, all of you are in America. So yeah. many Lithuanian Nazi collaborators ran away to America. In America, they could not prosecute these people for the crimes they committed during World War II because the crimes were committed outside the United States and the victims were not Americans. In order to change that, they would have had to change, get the approval of two thirds of the 50 states. And right. when they set up the Office of Special Investigations, it was already 1979. And they were already working against the clock. So they, they came up with what I call the Al Capone compromise. In other words, the same way that they wanted to nail Al Capone for racketeering, for murder, basically, and were unable to do so, they nailed them on income tax evasion. So here it's the same thing. When they emigrated on their applications, they lied. They didn't tell the truth about their service with the Nazis. When they got naturalized, and almost all of them did get American citizenship five or more years later, they were asked the same questions and they told the same lies. So they were, they were prosecuted for those offenses, violations. Now, what could, so what does that lead us to? It leads them to getting stripped of their American citizenship and then they can be deported. And almost all, in quite a few cases in, in the States, they were able to strip Lithuanians of their American citizenship and deport them. And almost every single one of those people went back to Lithuania and they were welcomed with open arms. Now, so my effort was to try and get them prosecuted on criminal charges in Lithuania because there's no statute of limitations on genocide. So, and all the sort of infrastructure of the legal effort was already done in the United States. Okay, Alexander Salakis was the head of the Saugumas, the Lithuanian uh, security and building district. Had 100 people under his control. They were the ones who guarded the Vilna ghetto. They were the ones who transported the Jews to Ponar. When he arrived, do you think he was sent to jail? No way. Right. They waited until he was too sick to be tried, and then they put him on trial. And, and then Lithuania passed three special laws. You can investigate a genocide suspect even if he's not medically fit. You can charge a genocide suspect even if he's not medically fit. And you can try him on a video lookup, hookup in his trial. They never even demanded that these people appear at the trial. And then when they finally sentenced someone to five years in prison, this is Algamantas Dailida, who worked for the Sargumas in Vilna, in, in Vilna, he was sentenced to five years in prison. The judges refused to, uh, to apply the sentence because his wife was sick. Not him. His wife was sick. So Nebuch, he can't be he can't be punished. Nebuch, it's a terrible thing. And he doesn't pose a threat to society. Listen, they did everything under the sun to turn the entire process into a farce. Now, think about it for a minute. If there's no convictions or no punishments, there were two convictions, but no punishments, maybe there were no crimes. Right. So, you know, when we wrote our book, I wrote a the book with Ruta, uh, Ruta Vanagaita, who also had this very similar to Sylvia's story, although yep. her grandfather was nowhere near the national hero that Jonas Dereka was. Okay, so what did, what did she do? She, first of all, she called, she called the book Musishki. Okay, so Musishki means our guys, our people, right? And through the letters of the book on the cover, you can see two, two, two faces. One is of a Lithuanian mass murder squad commander, uh, Novesha, Joris Novesha. And the other one is of a Jew, Yitzhak Anolik, who represented Lithuania in two Olympics. I think it's in Amsterdam and in London, or Paris and in London, or Paris okay. and Amsterdam, 24 and 28. Mm -hmm. And as Ruta said, and she, she always comes up with the brilliant things in this, in this context. Oh, he was good enough to represent us in the Olympics, but not good enough to live. He was murdered in the, in the ghetto, you know? Wow. So wow. the point was, no, no, her point was this. The problem in Lithuania was that neither the victims, they were Jews, 
they were communists. You know, they had this myth of Judeo-Bolshevism that all the Jews were communists. Right. And they're the ones who welcomed the Soviets, which is a total lie. And they're the ones who deported us to, to Siberia, total lie. 7,500 Jews were deported to Siberia, by the way, in those mass deportations of June, yeah, of June 41, right? And also the killers are not, are not part of our society. And this, this came through at the dedication ceremony in, in Ponar. The, the keynote speaker was Gediminos Magnorius. He was the prime minister of Lithuania. So he says, well, you know, this period was some, to something like a, it took a, the time of an eye blink, three months. So there were a lot of guests from Israel and, and, from, and other Jews around, and everyone's looking at each other. What's he talking about three months? It's three years, 41 to 44. But then it got even worse. And he said, the misdeeds of a few criminal elements, right. degenerates, social outcasts, cannot besmirch the reputation of a country where so much was done to save the Jews. And I'm sitting, I'm standing there wondering, and where are all those Jews? They're right sure. here in Ponar. That's where they are. And and you know what? No one said boo. No one said boo. I mean, people were polite. They didn't they didn't want to, you know, throw eggs at them or something. They didn't have so, it, of course. But but that this is the issue. So, so, so can you can you it's every every issue? Listen, when when these countries made the transition to democracy, they had to deal with six issues. One was acknowledgement of guilt and yep. apology. Two is commemoration of the victims. Three is prosecution of the unpunished criminals. Four is right, rewriting the history because all the history books were communist propaganda in the Soviet Union, right? Five is you, the history textbooks for the schools, all Soviet propaganda. So that also has to be rewritten. And the last thing is, is restitution. Now, sure. if we look back today, we're already 30 years after the Lithuania got independence in 1990, we can say that it has been a colossal failure because the narrative is the narrative drives everything. And the narrative is simply one big lie. That's so, so that's so, so that's the that's the question. And then I want to um, I have one more question for you, Ephraim, and then I want to have uh, Marilyn and Sylvia maybe comment. And then we'll, I want to get to your your news um, that we, we spoke about before. But but when you look at so you give a, a, a beautiful picture, high level picture of, of, of the history of the goddess here um, and, and some of the. Uh, the uh, specifics and and uh, strange twisted thinking, but when you look at today's Lithuanian leaders, the the some some of them are young members of the of their parliament, the same as, um, what's what's going through their mind? Uh, how, how, how do you explain or how do you see? If you, I don't know if you can explain it, but how do you see how are how are they embracing this history of lies? Um, I mean, it, it, taking Sylvia's. Uh, grandfather, as an example, and again using his time in Stuttgart to whitewash and erase uh, some of his crimes. How do you explain the embr the embracing of this uh, by today's leaders in Lithuania? I if think you can. it's very simple. Yeah. There's nothing like being a victim. Sure. If you're a victim, you can do every anything. You can tell lies. You can do the worst things possible, but you're a victim. You were under Soviet uh, occupation for 44 years. Everything has been done to emphasize the suffering of Lithuania under the Soviet occupation. Now, there's no question Lithuanians really suffered. It's all true. But part of their, part of their you know, fake narrative is to tr create the canard of equivalency between the Holocaust and Soviet occupation. And to insist that Soviet occupation consisted of genocide. And why is that important? Very simple. Because if communist crimes are genocide, that means Jews committed genocide. Because there were Jews in the end. Can there? Oh, if Jews committed genocide, how can they complain about the genocide, supposed genocide that Lithuanians committed? If everybody's guilty, nobody's guilty. People want to feel good about themselves. Nations, people who want to feel good about their country. If they were told the truth, they'd have a pretty lousy feeling. 
But what they don't understand is if they don't tell the truth, they'll never be able to get out from under the shadow of those crimes. Lithuania is a country that stuck, became independent with 3.5 million people. Today it has less than 2.5. It's a country that's emptying out. It's a country that faces terrible uh, problems of emigration out of Lithuania. And uh, I once I suggested to Ruta several times, I said, why don't you write a book about the curse of independence? Yeah. And it's all, yeah. I'm telling you, it all has to do with this. This is the shadow. This is the black cloud over Lithuania. It'll never go away until they start facing the truth. So our hopes is, and the Pope of people, I'm sure, like Sylvia and Marilyn as well, and Grant, that eventually the younger generation, the generation that right. grew up in the EU in, as Europeans, will finally see the truth. And uh, that's why what I, that was what we did in our book, what Ruta did in her second book, what Sylvia did in her book, was to write the truth in an accessible manner. There are right. Lithuanian historians who have written more or less the truth. No one's read it. And it's in scholarly journals. No one reads them. No one, you know, sits down when after a hard day at work and says, oh, let's read some, uh, you know, some highfalutin history. Doesn't work that way, right? So, so, and the government so on that, yeah. has not so, been moved one inch, or maybe one inch it's been moved, uh, in terms of changing the narrative. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for Lithuania. I already told them 15 years ago, I said, this is for your benefit, not for my benefit. I don't live here and I'm not affected by, by the, these lies about my country. That's not, that's not the case. But you will never get out from under it until you liberate yourselves. The only way to liberate yourselves is to tell the truth. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I do want to bring up... Uh, a comment from Grant, and I do have one more question. So Grant is here watching us, our old friend Grant. He says, the government of Lithuania issued a statement that those opposing their Holocaust revisionism are agents of the East, i.e. Russian agents, Jews, and other stupid sure. people. Sylvia Foddy, <laughs> Ruta Benegaita, Marilyn Kingston, Dylan Hosea is the biggest agent. <laughs> <laughs> so one question I have is, you know, we're fighting very hard, and you're in Israel, so uh, Holocaust education and history and remembrance is, is a pillar of, of the state of Israel. Um, here in the United States, there are attempts to and efforts to strengthen Holocaust education uh, moving forward. Um, how do you, as, as a historian and as a leader on this, on this issue, um, see the potential threat I, and I'll tell you, just for, as somebody who's who's an amateur on this issue, um, it definitely doesn't have the same credentials that you have. I, 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 I worry. I worry for the future of Holocaust education because if if governments in Europe and Eastern Europe can lie about their Holocaust history, I worry in 5, 10, 15 years how those lies may seep and bleed over into what we study here in the United States and other Western countries. Is that a valid concern? Definitely. It's definitely a valid concern, first of all, because it's not denial, it's distortion. Yeah. And that's much harder to identify and much harder to fight against because denial is so absurd and there's so much knowledge of the Holocaust um, and so many manifestations and so many, uh, you know, books, uh, plays, movies that all tell the story. So everyone, you know, any, they, like in the West, there's, Holocaust denial no longer is a serious threat because there's no normative social political organization that disseminates it. That's not to say that there won't be individuals who in Australia like Tobin or Zundel earlier in Canada and places like this, who they'll deny the Holocaust, but their influence is, is very, very marginal. Today, the real, the massive problem, of course, is in the, in, is in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, where in many cases, government Funded, government inspired, etc. Now, but the but the problem of distortion is a very very important problem because it undermines Holocaust research, Holocaust education, Holocaust commemoration, and it will it tell you it'll be a real tragedy if these lies proliferate. So I want to I want to uh, tell you, and some of you might know this already, is this whole issue with IRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Ira, uh, Ira passed a very, very important declaration against Holocaust distortion and is 
devoting this entire year to the fight against Holocaust distortion. Now, but the, the problem is this. Every decision in IRA has to be passed unanimously. And there are 34, I think it's 34, 36 members now. Countries that are the primary offenders in this regard sign this declaration. No, I mean, this is absurd. Right. Lithuania, uh, Ukraine isn't a member, by the way. Croatia, Latvia, mm -hmm. Estonia, Poland, Romania. So I don't know what to say. You know, the, the fact mm -hmm. that they're focusing on this is super important, but they are still not, I mean, they're not a statutory body that can implement any laws or pass any laws. So they can encourage people maybe to pass laws. But um, th this is something that requires a lot of investment in time and energy and a political will to fight against it. This is the problem. I, Listen, there's no difference in any uh, between any Lithuanian government since independence. They're all the same. And they aren't from the same parties. And they're not the same politicians. They all buy into this crap. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do want to bring up a comment uh, from one of our, our partners in this broadcast. Uh, Eddie Zilber, she mentions that the, Holo the Phoenix Holocaust Association and again, who is one of our co-sponsors here, has promoted and helped pass legislation to teach Holocaust in Arizona schools. So that was um, earlier this year. And con congratulations to uh, Alma Hernandez, who led that fight. Um, we're a big fan of hers and we support her work and we supported her bill uh, in, in, uh, in its passage. So, Eddie, thank you for watching and thank you for your support for this uh, broadcast. Uh, uh, Ephraim, I, we're, we're running a little long on time, but I do want to uh, bring in Marilyn. Just um, hearing um, Ephraim's explanation and, and uh, kind of as we close out this segment on uh, Studhoff uh, and your mother's experience, what are what is your reaction? What, what are some thoughts that you're going through your mind? Well, first of all, the contrast between what Sylvia's grandfather experienced and my mother experienced is vast. They're not, you can't call them both victims in the same sentence. It's, it's ludicrous to even think that way. Ludicrous. And, and what Ephraim is saying is obviously true, you know, and I want to bring up a point that I think is really important. And that is that I'm a product of the Los Angeles City Public Schools, born and raised in L.A. We never learned about the Holocaust. Never. It never came up. So I was fortunate because I had two parents and a grandmother who talked about it. A grandmother who lost six children, seven grandchildren. And her family. So people talked about it in my family. But I'm wondering, how about these kids now who are getting such a slanted view and don't realize how much people suffered and for what reason? You know, what was the reason? I do not blame Sylvia for what she did, for what her grandfather did. But rather, I really admire Sylvia because Sylvia was willing to face the truth. Sylvia was willing at her own personal peril. To say what happened, and to and to be to write it and to educate those of us who didn't know. I didn't know until I read Sylvia's book about honored guests. It ripped me apart. An honored guest. I, I thought about my mother with no clothes and starving and lost her family, and so slight, so little. How could she have survived? And then I hear about that he had sheets. Do you know what a contrast that is? It doesn't even make sense to someone who hasn't heard about it before. Sheets? My mother didn't have a bed. She didn't have anything. Nothing but fear. Well, amazing. Uh, Sylvia, do you want to um, give any last comments on this segment? This uh, honorary prisoner status really needs to be blown up and understood better because, because precisely nobody has ever heard of it. This is how... Um, Lithuanians have taken advantage of this story of him ha him having been in the in the Stutthof concentration camp because nobody has ever heard of honorary prisoner status and what that actually means. They just assume that if you were sent to Stutthof, you were treated like everybody else was treated, and they took advantage of that. Um, so this is this is a very very important distinction that that needs to, because every time. Every time I talk to a Lithuanian who cannot stand what I'm doing about my grandfather, they always bring up, but your grandfather was in the concentration camp. 
And I'm like, did you not read my book? I'm like, no, I, I wouldn't read that. Like that. I'm not going to read that. I'm like, well. <laughs> Don't confuse me with the facts. <laughs> Well, um, so so Ephraim, um, you so, and before we get to your news, I, I do want to thank um, uh, you, Dr. Zaroff and uh, Dr. Kingston. You you are members of ICANN's um, Holocaust uh, Education and Remembrance Advisory Council, um, and we are focused on uh, uh, strengthening Holocaust education in the United States. And just Ephraim, or, uh, sorry, uh, Marilyn, to your point, um, we are working in the state of California to strengthen the Holocaust education mm -hmm. standards, and we hope that we'll have a um, an announcement from Governor Newsom soon. Um, and our, our advisory council will be getting news on that in a, in a month or so. Um, so, uh, so Ephraim, you had some news that you wanted to share. The floor is yours, my friend. Um, this week, on Thursday, uh, a trial is scheduled to open in the town called Itzo, north of Hamburg of the secretary of the Commandant Hoppe, second Commandant of Stutthof, uh, who served there from uh, spring 43 until spring 45. And this is the time when Stutthof was converted into a camp that uh, was very active in terms of the final solution. This is when the Germans built the gas chamber there. They also sent gas vans there. Mm -hmm. So uh, this woman is supposed to go on trial now on Thursday. But uh, it's not actually, I just received word a couple of days ago that she had written a, she's 96 years old, Ermagard Fushner, uh, and she's written a letter to the judge or to the court indicating that she is not healthy enough to stand trial. Surprise, surprise. But um, so I don't know if it's going to open. In other words, um, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for an answer from the German uh, embassy here in Israel to, to know whether or not to, to go. Uh, but a week later, by the way, a second trial is opening. And in this case, there's no doubt because the person is healthy, has been examined. I mean, they've, all, they've both been examined very carefully by geriatric experts who know how to identify Wiesenthalitis. Do you know what that means? You know that disease, Wiesenthalitis? I, I can guess, That's but tell us. It's a disease that hits anyone who's about to be brought to justice. You understand? Sure. So all of a sudden, they try to look as sick and frail and as unfortunate as possible. So anyway, so in the second case, it's of a guard who served at Sachsenhausen. That's not far from Berlin, in Brandenburg. And thousands, tens of thousands of inmates uh, were killed there. And uh, the person who's going on trial is 100 years old. Wow. His name is Josef Schutz. He was a guard in Sachsenhausen for more than three years, and he is in very good shape, I hear. That's what the experts tell me. And uh, we've been very busy finding survivors from Stutthof and from Sachsenhausen. And in German law, there's something very interesting. If someone lost a first-degree relative, but only a first-degree relative, we're talking about parent, spouse, uh, spouse, uh, sibling, or child, they can join the prosecution and become co-plaintiffs and can even make statements in court and, and apparently also ask questions to the defendants. So we've been looking for them as well, and we found a few of those as well. And um, I, all I can say is I was, I was present at the uh, trial of Bruno Day, who was a watchtower guard in Stutthof, who was convicted in the summer of 2020. But uh, part of the problem was, it's very interesting. I had very mixed feelings about, about the case itself, and I'll explain to you why. They uh, became a watchtower guard in Stuttgart at age 17. And he was there for more than two years, or about, about two years. Mm -hmm. But because he was younger than 18 at the time that he became a guard, Believe it or not, and you don't don't burst out laughing. He had to be tried in a juvenile court. This is Germany, you know. Alice is an ordnung, as they say. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so and that affected the ultimate verdict. Now, so the verdict was that he was sentenced to two years in prison, but it was a suspended sentence. So I said to myself, where can I find the concentration camp to send him to the concentration camp where he can repeat the crime? Then they can punish him. 
But, <laughs> but of course, that's not happening. But one excellent thing emerged from that trial. And I don't know if any of you have actually read the verdict. The judge, Anne Maya Goring, wrote an absolutely brilliant verdict, tearing apart all the arguments against trying a person like Day. In other words, his elderly age, the fact that m much time had passed, the fact that you didn't have to prove, by the way, you don't have to, you no longer have to prove that he committed a specific crime against a specific victim motivated by racial hatred. That was changed 12 years ago in order to prosecute Damian Yu. Mm -hmm. So now it's all based on documents. And um, and of course, but the, 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 there is extensive testimony by survivors. A woman named, I, I, the day that I was there, a woman named Helena Strand from Melbourne, a Polish Jewess who was in the camp with her mother. Her mother died in her arms in the, in the middle of a typhus epidemic. She gave a brilliant testimony, crystal clear, all the details. You know, 93 years old. So she's 93. Bruno Day was 93. Why ignore them if they're in good health? And, mm -hmm. and the verdict, I, I, would, I would say to the German government, I, I've said this publicly, that, that the Judge uh, Maya Goring's uh, document is a document that should be read in every school in the world. It's an absolutely phenomenal document. And we're going to try and uh, make sure that it's publicized and gets uh, as wide coverage as possible. Uh, Ephraim, just on, on this this point of of the age of um, perpetrators and and uh, people who participated in the Holocaust, is it true? And I, I, is it true that we're coming to the end of that era uh, of when there are there are fewer and fewer people to try? And and if so, what what do you what do you make of what do you make of this time in, in history? First of all, it's obvious. Yeah, that's the nature of the world we live in, right? Yeah, sure. Um, I sometimes say, half jokingly, that people without a conscience live longer. Sure. And that's one of the reasons why these people are still alive. But the main reason the people are still alive is because of the extension of life expectancy. Sure. In other words, if this were 1920 and it was 80 years after the beginning of the mass murder of Jews of Lithuania, for example. Or seventy, you know, seventy-six years after the end of the war, I, I doubt any any people would have been left. But most of the Nazis live in countries like Germany and Austria with good medical care. Mm -hmm. So, extension of life expectancy, the good medical care, the lack of a conscience, maybe it's by part of it. So I'm I'm busy praying for their health. I'm telling you. Sure. I'm the only Jew in the world who prays for the good health of Nazis. Absolutely. Only the ones who can be brought to trial, of course, mm -hmm. not the sure. others. Sure, sure. But but what do you wait? So what do you make of this uh, point in history? I, I I worry, I I, I worry that as we lose uh, witnesses, and we've got governments like Lithuania and young young new up and coming leaders who are still embracing lies, um, and we don't have any more trials, that we that we are at greater risk for of losing the losing the past. Listen, the risk, the risk certainly exists, but I have to tell you something. We, when I say we, the people who have devoted their lives to studying the Shoah, researching the Shoah, writing about the Shoah, you know, creating educational tools, writing books, and uh, you know, working in organizations like Maryland's organizations, we've yeah. been preparing for this for the last 50 years. Yeah. And an enormous, an absolutely enormous amount of information has been gathered. Much of it, like in the Spielberg Foundation, is in the form, in the best possible form of live videos. And um, we're ready. After, I think we are ready. We're as, oh, let's put it this way. We're as ready as we can be. Okay. Maybe digital world will create something new <laughs> that will recreate the, the events in a more live way. But uh, no, I'm saying, assuming that doesn't happen, um, we're ready. I think we really are ready. And I, I think we all owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to the people, the thousands, it's already thousands of people, Jews and non-Jews, from all walks of life, from all different religions, who have devoted their lives to dedicating, in other words, to explaining the Holocaust to the world, teaching the Holocaust, and 
and trying to spread the word of the dangers posed by movements like the Nazis and uh, and the lessons of the Holocaust, the right lessons of the Holocaust. Let's put it that sure. way. Sure. Well, I think uh, on that note, um, Ephraim, we have one comment for you. Uh, Nancy says that she appreciates hearing about Wiesenthalitis. So thank you for <laughs> taking away anything. I was but I didn't have to. I, I was embarrassed to do it. Wait, say it. Say it again. I wanted to call it Zerophytis, but you know, I think that that's bragging already. <laughs> well, uh, we'll, well, we'll, we can do, we can use both. We'll use both. How about that? <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, so I think that that takes us here to the end of the, of this broadcast. Um, Ephraim, thank you so, so much uh, for joining us. It's always great to see you and, and to, to hear you and uh, to hear you share the work that you're doing. Um, and, and Marilyn and Sylvia, again, thank you for sharing your stories. And uh, I very much appreciate your time. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Th thank you, and thank you all for your work. Uh, again, as as uh, the CEO of uh, ICANN, uh, who represents Israelis in America, our Israeli community um, it cares very deeply about Holocaust education, and um, this is why we prioritize this work. And so we couldn't do it without you, Marilyn, and without you, Ephraim, and of course, without you, Sylvia. So uh, thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. You're a great you, Dylan. work. Thank you, guys. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. All right. And thank you uh, for all who are watching. And uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. If you're watching us on Facebook, go ahead and like our page. And we will uh, share with you uh, our next uh, broadcast once we get it scheduled. Thank you all.